Today on Day of Discovery, In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon. He could have gone back into the wilderness and hightailed it out off that mountain like all these other thieves and robbers would do as soon as they start to see the authority coming up the hill at them on the Mount of Olives, they would escape back to the wilderness. He had his choice to do that then. And he said, not my will be done, but thine. I mean, which is the ultimate uh, response, isn't it? Not my will, but thine be done. Welcome to In His Footsteps with Day of Discovery. I'm Jim Candelon. Today we're gonna to be looking at something absolutely fascinating. That's John's baptism in the Jordan River. Baptizing tens of thousands of people who came down from Judea and other parts of Israel and the Galilee, and even Jesus himself. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. This is something that has gripped the imagination of scholars and just everyday believers throughout the ages. And it certainly has gripped mine. And so we'll deal with it from a scriptural perspective. I'll give you a lot of background but then, a little later in the program, Dr. Steve Fawn will come our way, and he will talk to me uh, about the context of this baptism, about the eschatological future hope that John's baptism represented. So, you stay with me. I'll be back with the Bible teaching right after this break. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. Okay, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is Jesus being baptized by his cousin John. I'll uh, get into that in a minute. John was a character. In fact, at one point later on, John will say, or I said, Jesus will say, that John was, if you will, uh, operating in the spirit of Elijah. He was a prophet, the like of which Israel had not seen for at least 400 years. It amazes me, frankly, the Bible says that all of Judea, all of Judea came down to Jordan to be baptized by John. I really wonder what that means. Uh, now, Jerusalem only had about 25,000 population at that time, but still, all of Judea. I, this guy obviously had a huge impact, such a huge impact that even Herod, who was in charge of the region at that time for Rome, uh, had huge respect for him, was intrigued by him, and protected him. Uh, John was something else. His baptism was referred to as a baptism of repentance. Repentance. It wasn't necessarily a confession of faith, it was a baptism of repentance. Meaning what? Calling people to repent from their sin. Not just to confess their sin, which is essentially easy to do, but to repent from their sin, which is hard to do. Confession is emotional. I did it, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Repentance is volitional. I choose to stop, turn around, walk in a 180 degree new direction. That's an act of the will and it's never easy. That's the baptism that John called people to. And he was calling them to both right relationship with God and right relationship with neighbor. His baptism was a baptism about righteousness and justice. He wanted people to repent of their idolatries, of their sinful behavior as related to their holy heavenly father. But he also wanted them to repent of their sins against their neighbor, their neglect of their neighbor, their abuse of their neighbor, their uh, uh, taking advantage of their neighbor. And so he says, what you've got to do is prepare the way of the Lord. What's, what's, what's with that? John was a part of this messianic hope culture. During that 400 years of silence, prophetic silence, as there was this movement, albeit small, but that never died, of people in Israel who hoped for, prayed for, expected the coming of Israel's king, the anointed one, the Messiah of Israel, of the line of David. John believed that Messiah was at the door. Now what's interesting about this is that at the same time, just 
literally a few miles from where he was baptizing people in the Jordan, there was a group of men called the Essenes. These fellows lived in an area right down by the Dead Sea, this, the uh, uh, western um, uh, shore of the Dead Sea, in a place called Qumran. This is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1948. These fellows believed in utmost purity. They had left the cities and the towns because they believed that they were polluted spiritually. And they had left them and had, in the desert, created this uh, sterile atmosphere for uh, spiritual uh, growth to, uh, to, to happen. And so while they were in Qumran, they would spend most of their hours in prayer, uh, in ritual cleansing, mikvot, as in the plural, having immersion in water. But they also wrote a number of things of which we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of the things that they wrote was entitled, The uh, War of the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. They believed that Messiah was at the door. And in order for Messiah to take his rightful place, he had to have an army. These would be the sons of light, as opposed to the sons of darkness. There would be a battle. Messiah would win, but he needed soldiers. And so the way to achieve this army was through ritual purification by way of baptism. Now, the Bible doesn't say that that's what John was up to, but it is remarkable, the parallels between John and the Essenes, even his uh, ascetic lifestyle. These guys at Qumran were very much ascetic. So is John, wearing, I mean, in this heat, I mean, it's 110 degrees as I'm talking to you right now. In this heat, wearing a coat of camel hair, turned inwards, and eating locusts for his food, and some wild honey. I mean, how the guy survived is beyond me. But he lived a very ascetic lifestyle, and I guess this added moral authority to, uh, to his ministry. But nevertheless, he believed Messiah was at the door, and he also believed that both Jew and Gentile had to be cleansed. Not just the Jewish nation, but the nations, plural. This was an eschatological uh, conflict that was going to involve the entire world. So he called to both Jew and Gentile to come and be cleansed. And he said to those who were Jewish who came down to be baptized. You must not think that by saying, I have Abraham for my father, that that's enough. He said, it's not enough. He says, you've got to cleanse your ways. Getting back to the righteousness justice theme. You've got to flee your idolatry. You've got to flee your materialism. You've got to flee your um, adulteries. And you've got to make yourself pure to be in right relationship with a holy God. And secondly, with your neighbor, you gotta stop exploiting him. In fact, he says to them, share your coats, share your food, even with the occupying soldiers. Can you believe it? Treat them kindly. That's a part of the justice aspect of your repentance. So it was a tough message, but this is what he preached. And so he baptized them. It was like a mikvah, like a ritual bath, Absolutely a tough message. In fact, this is part of the challenge of the Christian faith. It doesn't want us to remain as we are. It insists that we be transformed. And nobody wants to be changed. Do you want to be changed? Someone has said the only one who wants to be changed is a wet baby. I mean, none of us wants to really change our behavior. And yet this is what the baptism of repentance is all about. So when John was challenging the people of Judea to come down and become a part of this new army, ready to march with the Messiah, he was looking for hardened spiritual people. Not hard in the sense of their minds and their hearts, but hardened in the sense that they knew that this was a tough call and they were prepared to meet the rigors of that calling. Coming up in a few minutes, Dr. Steve Fon, who is a world expert in Dead Sea Scrolls history, and he'll be giving us more about John's baptism. Stay with us. Sitting here in Jerusalem for the inter interview segment with Dr. Steve Fon, president of the University of the Holy Land. We're just picking up where we left off. We started talking about the Jordan River Valley last show. Tonight, today we're gonna to get a bit more focused on John the Baptist and his baptism. 
And uh, Steve, you were referencing the Essenes and John the Baptist and the possible relationship between the two of them. Um, John described his baptism as a baptism of repentance. Was this consistent with what the Essenes were calling for? Well, I think that, yes, it is. And they were only being consistent with the prophets of the Old Testament, that where they felt that the proper piety toward God had to be uh, attended with a real heart that is exposed to God. Uh, the Essenes talked about that the way of the Lord was the way of God's heart. And so th this was something that they had to do to repent and then come and be, be immersed to be able to enter into fellowship within the group. I'm intrigued when I read about John's baptism because one, one of the gospel accounts says, all of Judea came down to be baptized. And I'm thinking, what? Is this an exaggeration? Is this just sort of a generalization? Or was he so charismatic and so convincing in his call to baptism that no one could resist the call? They would come all the way down. I mean, that is one long journey from Jerusalem, especially down to where he was baptizing people. What was the appeal? Well, the, the appeal of John the Baptist was that he was not just uh, feeling that you had to work the Torah to death before you actually were acceptable to God, but rather that when he brought people down to the, to the Jordan River, they were coming to him looking for something that was different in their lives. There was turmoil going on, a lot of questions concerning ethics and all the other things that were a problem in that day. But with this kind of a fullness of times, it was both John the Baptist and the Essenes that actually were drawing in what they feel is a whiff of the coming of the Messiah, the time in which that, that Messiah will come and to do, have restitution for all things. And this is the fullness of times. It's something that was already in effect back with the prophets when they were saying, listen, it's not enough for you to have uh, to be doing things like like offering up offerings to God, to pour libations on the on the altar. If you're coming in up to the altar with uh, injustice in your heart, then it's like offering up a dog with a broken neck or pouring mm. wine swine's blood on the altar mm. instead of wine. Mm. And it's something that to us we say, well, if you don't have your heart in the right place, God's not going to listen to your prayer. They're saying that it's an abomination if you come before God and you don't have your heart. In the right now, you place. know, when you read the major prophets and the minor prophets for that matter, it seemed that, that one of God's biggest gripes with the children of Israel was they were constantly forgetting him and they were falling into idolatry. Then you've got this 400 year period of time called the silent period where there was no prophetic voice in Israel. Why this sudden remembrance of God? Why this sudden sensitivity? Why would people be so almost en masse concerned about their uh, spiritual condition? There were just too many groups around at the time. And even though ethics be, were even a, um, an important theme among the Pharisees, it's still something where there was enough corruption in the, in the ranks and enough of, of a lack of, of hope of being free from, from the, the, the sin that's brought in, the, the Gentile uh, leadership that is, is over them through the Romans, from the Greeks before them. All of this was something that finally came to a head. They felt it's time for something to happen. And there were many groups that were looking for a Messiah and many groups that were saying, we'll do whatever we, we can to be able to achieve that. Some through violence, some through the proper way of acting, some through leaving the land. There's all these that actually tried to find a way to come back to a place with God, to re, not to reinvent, but to, to re, um, rebuild the children of Israel that was worthy of the land that they were to, uh, to have forever. And this is, a, this, is, this is really the whole point of all the rebel groups. Yeah. Threw off the yoke of the Romans, the Messiah, how's he gonna come? He's gonna come up to Jerusalem, number one. Throw off the yoke of the Romans, number two and creating the eternal reign, right. the final thing. So into all of this uh, apocalyptic and messianic fervor comes this 
prophet from Nazareth, lately of Capernaum, John the Baptist's cousin. And he comes down to be baptized by John. And John recognizes what's going on and says, I'm not worthy to be baptizing you. And Jesus says, no, um, it's required of us to fulfill all righteousness. Why do you suppose Jesus submitted himself to John's baptism of repentance? Jesus was, uh, when he was growing up, had the opportunity to go up to Jerusalem and be like every smart uh, man of the Bible, young man of the Bible, to study under the best. In fact, people listening to him say, this man teaches as though he has authority, but he hasn't received authority. Mm -hmm. See, it's more of a surprise than it is has standing in awe. And what this does is it gives one episode in, in Jesus's life in which he as a child is accepted thoroughly by the wise people at the temple, but he goes home and repent in um, honor of his parents. Yeah, he submits himself to his parents. And that was what made a totally different line of ministry for him. Now, his authority wasn't gonna come from the Pharisees. It wasn't gonna come yeah. from the the priests in the temple, it was actually going to be brought to him through John the Baptist. And that's what happened. And why in John, he says, says uh, they ask him, where do you get to this authority? And he says, tell me, the baptism of John, is that of God or is that of man? Ah. See, it was all ah. issues of authority. So in, in a sense, this baptism was a kind of a turning point. I mean, was it sort of the beginning, the opening of the door to uh, Jesus' public ministry. Yeah, definitely. 30 years old, that's when the priests began to serve in the temple. Really, when they were 30. Right from the baptism, he goes to the wilderness to be tempted. Uh, 40 days, right, by, by, by Satan. Mm -hmm. um, you spent a lot of time in the wilderness. Uh, I guess all archeologists in Israel do. Uh, it can be a very hot time, uh, the last, uh, well, as we've been taping these programs, we've been doing it in the heat of summer, and boy, enough to knock you out. Um, when it says that Jesus uh, didn't eat for 40 days, surely he must have had some water. Do you think? In the wilderness, uh, there's ways of getting water in the wilderness, there yeah. is. Uh, but normally they talk about uh, these types of fasts that they're doing in, in Judaism without water as well. Really? You can. Uh, you think someone could live that long <laughs> in this heat without water? Well, the the uh, it's a, it's a, it's hard to believe, but uh, there are people that have done it. Really? But you have to imagine Jesus as being one who's being tempted by by Satan, and and he could have been giving him something to eat, something to drink, all kinds of things that he was being temp tempted by. But do you know? How did, how did Jesus fight back with Satan? Quoting scripture. Quoting scripture. It's yeah. like a good Baptist or anyone else. It's just <laughs> quoting scripture. Yeah. That, that fixes it. But that was something that was really very important for, for him was that he wasn't tempted by anything. Hmm. He had to put it all aside. The greater temptation came from when he was on the Mount of Olives. Hmm. If on. this cup can pass from me, Nevertheless, that's not my will, but thine be done. That's what he said. Yeah. We have a hard time understanding uh, the Son of God saying that to his father. Yeah, really. He could have gone back into the wilderness and hightailed it out off that mountain like all these other thieves and robbers would do as soon as they start to see the authority, the, the uh, police coming up the hill at them on the Mount of Olives, they would escape back to the wilderness. He had his choice to do that then. And he said, not mm. my will be done, but thine. thine. Which is the ultimate uh, response, isn't it? Not my will, but thine be done. I've got about four minutes, Steve. I wanna shift gears here uh, and speak to you as a, not just as the president of the University of, Hol of the Holy Land, but also as an archeologist, as an academic. Uh, you're working on some very exciting uh, finds right now, which will be uh, published soon, which I won't get into. Um, it seems to me there's been a lot of discovery lately. I was just talking to an authority from the city of David recently. A lot of discovery, archaeological discovery lately, that it's just affirming, affirming, affirming the historicity of the uh, biblical texts. Uh, is this an unusual period of time, 
or has this always been the case that uh, archaeology has been affirming the scripture? Not everyone believed that. Not even in Europe today, they tell students that if you study, uh, want to study scripture, don't bring archaeology into it because the scriptures are just a beautiful uh, manifestation of God, of God and man in their creativity. Right, you know? right, right. And and that is uh, oftentimes people finding a way around the miraculous. Right. And the miraculous thing that we find in 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 uh, scripture today is that every time. It's being challenged, whether it's being challenged that David was uh, was truly a patriarch or not, and where he's just a little chieftain and right. not really anyone of any uh, use to, in in history, other than to his family who wrote up nice things about him later on. Right. So as soon as that was written up by a professor in Tel Aviv, all of a sudden, up out of the ground at, at Tel Dan, there's a it, there's a uh, stele that comes out, a, a written inscription that, that uh, has Hazael, the king of Syria, boasting that he has killed the king of Israel and the king of Beit David. A hundred years later, there's nothing nothing like a dynasty like calling an entire Beit kingdom Beit David. The house of David. It? Yeah. Huh. I, I've also heard it said out there that Moses didn't exist. Not only that David was just a provincial little despot, but that Moses didn't exist. Um, wh what do you suppose is one of the more exciting finds of late from your perspective as an archaeologist? Well, my of recent years, I mean, that was very important, finding the name of David on yeah. that stele. But then to come, come up with uh, someone from a, about 100 years later, a little more than that, Elisha, to be able to find a room His for house. a holy man only <laughs> 10 kilometers away, with with name the name Elisha on a plaque inside that room with the bed, the the chair back and the table, and incense altars to be given uh, thanks to God, this is really something that does either it's uh, a man who actually has taken uh, some time to be a, a a prophet and has succeeded at it at, at Rehov, that close to where Elisha was growing up, contemporary with Elisha growing up, uh, and that it was just another Elisha. Or you can actually go along with what seems really reasonable here and to say, this really is indeed the house of Elisha himself. Well, it's a fantastic uh, discipline in archaeology. I'm not one, you are, but I read enough from archaeologists to know that this is almost a golden era right now in archaeology especially what's coming out of Israel currently. Dr. Steve Fine has been my guest, and I'll be having him again sometime in the future on this program. But uh, we'll take a little break, and I'll be back with the close right after this. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. You know, Jesus' baptism is totally intriguing. 30 years of preparation for ministry. And now as a 30-year-old young man, he comes to be baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River. Reasons why, you gotta study the scripture for yourself. It's a bit of a mystery. But here's the interesting thing about it as far as I'm concerned. At this point in time, his ministry really begins. The first thing that happens is he's off to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And I'll be talking about that at a later point in this series. But here's the thing, at this point, because of this baptism, it marks Jesus' transition from the village to the world. The village being Capernaum, the world being the world. It was a passage. It was a crossing over. It was a critical transition in Jesus' life. And for you and me, baptism is often exactly that. You know, the Bible talks about old things passing away, all things becoming new. The symbolism of baptism has always been one of dying to the old life under the water and rising to the new life coming out of the water. A witness to the fact that the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit can literally make us new creations in Christ. And that, of course, is our hope that all of you who watch this program will experience that marvelous transformation as well. Jesus is our example. It's a powerful example. John the Baptist was catalyst to that whole ministry, and we have much to say, both in terms of thanks to John 
and praise to Christ for what he accomplished for us on that day. I'm Jim Catalan. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time. Join us again next week at this same time for another Day of Discovery. Day of Discovery is a video outreach of Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada and is supported by the free will gifts of friends like you who enjoy these programs. For more information about Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada, please visit us online at ourdailybread.ca.